be careful when you enter Big Sky Country. You might just encounter some big mysteries. Due to Black Friday weekend and that I am currently in retail, my time has been a bit limited as you might imagine. So I figured I could get you a gift that you may enjoy and would still allow me to post today. A compilation of over two hours of creepy, reportedly true, cryptid stories. I wanted to take a moment and say thank you to all my current and all of my new subscribers and all of you listening for joining me for these stories. Thank you all so much for allowing me to do what I love to do. If you like these terrifying tales and have not already done so, please hit that subscribe button along with a notification button so you make sure not to miss a video. Now, get your cryptid on. Enjoy. The Redwood Cabin by Kuro Kiryu Chan. I used to live in Japan, but recently moved to a town somewhere in America. At our town, there was a story going around that a cult had a cabin somewhere in the woods near our town, and that they were doing incantations, summoning spirits and specters, the usual paranormal stuff. Me and my friend Jack, who I had met when I first came to town, didn't really believe in the paranormal. So when we had an opportunity to do so, we would every so often camp near the section of where the cabin was rumored to be and search around for it. It didn't take long since on our fifth time, we found where it was. The cabin was completely hideous. It was infested with cockroaches, spiders, and even some centipedes. The left side of the cabin was decayed slightly, and the right side had a bit of a termite problem. At first, it looked like any old run-down cabin. Then we took a second, much closer look. That was when a horrid stench hit us. It was horrible. I gagged and almost vomited. Even though I was busy dealing with the stench, Jack was able to get a look at the walls. They were covered with signs, up-down crosses, blood-red eyes, and the most frightening part, bodies of people, completely stripped of their clothing and nailed to the wall of the cabin. I thought of calling the police or running. Jack, however horrified he was, insisted on going into the cabin. I'm not believing this. It's probably just some really good deco, he said. As reluctant as I was, I pushed onward, Jack leading with his flashlight. We opened the door slowly. That was when I couldn't take it anymore. I vomited onto the grass just to the left of the cabin. The reason I vomited was even worse than the stench outside. Just in the front door was a dead dog. It had been butchered and left to rot. Worse, it was a local dog that had went missing just two days before we found the cabin. Jack gently pushed the dog to the side so he can get inside. He waited a bit for me and we kept going. Inside was like the exterior, only exception was blood red runes replacing the bodies. We came into the main living room of the cabin. It had a big ritual circle. The walls were different too, this time now sporting words such as devil, the beast, our master, the end, and much more terrifying words, such as the runes and the eyes. It was blood red, except this time it seemed like there was real blood. That was when I figured out that the other drawings were simply dried and it didn't look as clear as these. The more I figured out, the worse I felt. If the others were dried, wouldn't that mean these were just made? That was when I had it. I couldn't take it anymore. I turned to the cabin door and what I saw, I can never unsee. A tall, slender figure covered in intestines, blood, organ, and everything gross and putrid. It was blocking the cabin door. That was when I screamed as loud as I could. I turned back to look at Jack. Though he still looked like Jack, the man I looked at was carrying a knife. He had a grin on his face, widening by the second. I backed away from him, but he grabbed my arm and dragged me closer. I struggled, trying to get away, but his grip was locked firmly. I watched in horror as the knife was raised. That was when I made a last-ditch effort. I kicked him in the forbidden zone, which worked, and I ran toward the direction of the door. That was when I bumped into the slender figure again. Now I couldn't make out its face, but what I saw was not human. It looked like the face of something out of the depths of hell itself. I shambled back a bit, then remembering Jack was there, 
I moved to the right. I found a window, the only window in the entire cabin. I tried and tried to open it, but it simply didn't budge. I turned back in shock as I realized this is how it was going to end. I was going to be murdered in some satanic cabin by my friend. I crouched down now in tears and closed my eyes. I waited for the knife to end it all. I waited, but eventually nothing happened. So I slowly opened my eyes and saw that it was daytime. Jack, or possessed Jack, had collapsed on the floor, still clenching the knife. The slender figure was gone. I tried the window again, and now that it was daytime, I saw that it was locked. I unlocked it and opened it up. How silly, I thought, that I didn't check for the lock. I made a mental note to always do that and then proceeded to exit via the window, carrying Jack through it first. I ran to our campsite, put Jack in his tent, and went into mine. I recapped what happened and then put this in my diary. Though this wasn't the nearest near-death experience I have ever had, it was definitely the most extreme and grotesque. I waited for Jack to wake up and then headed back to town with him. I never told anyone what had happened and definitely didn't tell Jack, who is now my best friend of all time, that he almost killed me. Arizona Desert Skinwalker by Smoking Owl I had an experience many years back that I want to finally put down on paper. It was in 2003 when I was moving from California to New York. I haven't mentioned this story to anyone except those closest to me because my fear is that talking about it will bring it back to me. It's bad enough to keep haunting memories in hidden caverns of my mind. I don't also want people to think that I lost my mind out in the Arizona desert on that starry night. I live in Denmark now, so that night in the American desert seems like a world and an era away. Nothing happened to me in the sense of the body. While it was happening, it was terrifying and traumatizing. I have never been so scared, so alone in such a huge, empty world, and in such imminent danger as that night. If you fear that talking about or reading about animal spirits can conjure them into your life, I recommend that you stop reading here. Here's my story. I had taken a job offer in New York City and quit my job in San Francisco, so I had a month in between of free time. This was just a couple years after university, so I have friends that had moved back from our university town in Santa Cruz to various places around the country. With this free month, I could do what I wished. So I packed my things, everything I owned, into my pickup truck with a camper top and headed out on a road trip to visit my college friends around the country while driving to New York. Honestly, I lost track of time in Los Angeles after many nights at various venues and events. I had been crashing at the apartment of my friend Kyle, actually crashing at the apartment of some girl that Kyle was crashing at, as there was always another event being promoted or reason to stay a few more days. I woke up on a Tuesday morning, wrote a goodbye note, and ventured out to find my pickup truck with all of my stuff. It was a bit of a panic because had it been stolen, the only physical possession I would still have in this world would be left to the knapsack on my shoulder. I found my truck and pulled out headed for Las Vegas. The next city I wanted to visit a friend in was Atlanta, but I figured I'd do some solo adventuring and hit Las Vegas in the Grand Canyon while in this part of the country. When I came to the desert town of Barstow, which is a couple hours east of Los Angeles, I lost control of the truck for a second, grabbing the steering wheel and managed to pull over haphazardly, but safely, to the shoulder of the highway. This was lucky as the highway had a lot of big trucks. I got out to inspect and my back left tire was flat. These details are not part of the experience in Arizona, but set the scene leading up to it. It was a feeling of the days of several days of socializing with wannabe celebrities in Los Angeles, followed by what felt like a very unsafe and shocking experience on the desert highway. I switched out the flat tire for the spare, 
Each time a big rig would be heading my way, I would literally run around my parked pickup truck to avoid it and try and stay safe. The flat tire being on the left side of my truck meant I had to jack the truck up and do the work with my body situated just by the most right lane of the highway. This is the lane that the big trucks like to drive in. All was fine, and I could drive a few miles until I found a tire repair shop. It was a small, cheap shop somewhere in the desert, run by Spanish-speaking Mexicans. The shop was one of those cinder block and aluminum workshops with plenty of tires hanging along the wall with cheap prices painted on the tires with white paint. It turns out that it was just the air intake valve that broke, likely from the desert heat. It literally cost only $4.50 to repair. That being all good, I realized that it was now close to sunset, so I changed my plans. I decided to forget Las Vegas and the Grand Canyon solo adventure and hightail it out from my next destination city all the way on the East Coast, Atlanta, Georgia. This would turn out to be the most terrifying night of my life. The flat tire was just the fear appetizer before the pure dread of hell would be unleashed. So, I pull out of the tire repair shop with determination to get to the East Coast as soon as I could and not stop unless necessary. I decided I'm going to drive east as long as I can until I am too tired and will then get my rest in the truck. Early in the eve, I was really enjoying the drive. With a crimson red and glittering gold sky behind me, the desert was beautiful in its vast, empty serenity. As I had spent most of the past two years in an office environment, I was feeling exultation by the chance to be under such a gigantic and beautiful open sky above the flat sand of the desert. And the tall cactus were majestic and proud as they scrolled past my truck on each side. Sunset fell into darkness, and the celestial show above the desert was another display of the natural world's unbelievable beauty. There was no moon, at one chance, I pulled over just to look up. The road was pretty empty. It was not quite midnight, and aside for the stars, I could see the Milky Way. And when you see it like that, it really lives up to its name. Suddenly, I felt uncomfortable. I had a sense that this intoxicating beauty was somehow luring me into danger. And I was surprised to suddenly feel very alone. It was just little me and all my humble belongings packed under the camper top of an old yellow Toyota pickup truck. I drove on. My fascination with the natural beauty soon waned until the night desert was like a hypnotist of sand and cactus counting down from 10 and putting me in a trance. The road was all mine at this hour and it was one of those moments where it felt like I could be the only person alive on the planet. And then, I saw something in my rearview mirror to remind me that I'm not alone. It wasn't a car, though. It was a man. He was running, but as I was driving faster, I thought that I must have just driven past him and just seen him now. I drove on. But I was no longer sleepy. I was wide awake and my mind was racing to rationalize what it was I had just seen. I didn't get a good view, but I had seen a man. It just didn't add up. Something was off. I couldn't think of a scenario where a man would be running along a freeway late at night, out, way out in a desert. I relaxed for a few moments. I, I must have just been seeing things. Some of those cactus could make you think you saw anything. I drove on with an elevated level of alertness. Now, I didn't want to stop. There might be something out there. And you know, I'm going to see him again. I knew that night I would see him again. I drove on. On that straight road leading east, I saw him again in my rearview mirror. This time, he was not fading away but holding speed about 10 or 12 car lengths back. I could barely see him. I checked my speed. I was doing 60 miles per hour. 
Impossible, I thought. I let my speed slag off a little bit, and indeed, the man got closer. I could see him good now about two to three car lengths behind me and illuminated slightly red from my backlights. He was naked and barefoot and running like that. It was amazing and terrifying. What is this creature and what does it want with me? I decided I had had enough and floored it. My truck was pretty loaded and doesn't accelerate good anyways. So as the speedometer moved ever so slowly up, my focus stayed on the man running behind my truck. He picked up speed and ran around so that he was running in the oncoming lane to my left from the driver's side. I could see him real good now through the driver's side window. His hair was dark and pushed back about neck length and his skin dark and his face black with angled white stripes like he had some sort of war paint on it. I checked the speedometer and was hitting almost 90. I drove on and he ran with me. I did not understand how it, this man, could run this fast and barefoot. He then accelerated faster than I was driving at, and I watched him run off ahead at an insane speed. I couldn't believe the speed of those legs moving as he sprinted down the straight flat road. I drove on, with my heart pounding, adrenaline pumping, and sheer waves of dread pulsing through my body. I thought to turn around and go the opposite way, but realized what the use if he can run that fast it doesn't matter I drove on I hadn't seen a car or any humans at least who can't outrun a car for over an hour and then the truck bumped there were stones on the highway they were small stones but I tapped on the brakes then I floored the brakes because the man was standing in the middle of the street with arms up and out a bit like he is putting on a challenging display. He pointed both his index figures at me with parallel arms, and then, while holding his gaze, he wiped his neck with his finger horizontally, from left to right, miming a throat cut by a knife. I understood this sign language. The man walked up to outside by the driver's side window and tapped on my window several times. I was afraid he would break the window. He was talking in some language, like a Native American language, that made no sense to me. I could see his face very clearly. He did have some kind of black paint on his face with three white stripes under each eye and white oval on his forehead. He continued to rant, blustering with a firm gaze. I was relieved to see two headlights in the rearview mirror. A rig was approaching. The man looked in the direction from where we had come. He looked back at me, and I saw his eyes. They were dark. At that instant, the man ran off from the road and into the deep desert. The truck veered into the oncoming lane to pass, and my truck shook and waned from the vacuum and force of air as the rig passed, with its blaring horn giving a deafening Doppler effect. And it passed. And in sudden darkness, I watched the dust fall back to the road as the rig slowly vanished into the darkness ahead. I drove on. The sun rose, and only stopping to get gas in New Mexico, I did not dare take my sleep break until I was in Texas Wednesday night. I will not be doing any driving in the deserts of the American Southwest. I feel as though there is a spirit there that knows who I am. We have unfinished business, and I prefer not to see it again. There was something knocking at my door, submitted by Unique Individual 20. This happened about two years ago, nearing the end of September. My aunt and her friend decided to fly up to New York from Panama to enjoy their mini vacation with my parents and I. Although many strange and paranormal experiences have happened to me ever since I was little, this event stayed with me and affected me more than the other experiences. Here's the thing, 
Many things have happened to a lot of my family members, especially my aunt and her friend. We'll get back to that later. So it is around 10.30 at night. Keep in mind that my old neighborhood was a very calm and quiet place. Since I live near the countryside, not much action happens in the neighborhood. The neighbors were either elderly or young couples with small children, none that could cause trouble around the neighborhood. There were only about 20 to 25 houses in the entire neighborhood I lived in. Moving on, the three of us decided to stay up late to watch scary movies while my parents slept upstairs in their room. My aunt's friend was sitting near the sliding doors leading to the backyard while my aunt and I were sitting in the bigger couch near the front door. I was sitting on the left side where the door faced and my aunt sat on the right side of me, which meant I was the closest to the front door. We spent about 10 minutes debating on which movie we should watch. After those 10 minutes, we finally chose to watch Odd Thomas, which wasn't really a scary movie, but was about a guy who could see spirits and demons. What a coincidence. We were only two minutes into the movie when I had a sudden urge to look at the door. I glanced back at my aunt and her friend, only to see them staring at the door as well. I looked back at the door for about five seconds and a loud bang came, and then another one following after, and then a third one. All three bangs came from the front door, almost as if five people had just body slammed into the door three times. I thought it was going to fly off its frame. My first instinct was to run to the kitchen and grab a knife, but as I was about to do that, my aunt grabbed me by my shirt and told me to stay down. As I looked to my right, I saw my aunt's friend with her knees to her chest, rocking herself back and forth while my aunt just kept her gaze toward the door. While all three of us kept our attention to the door, next to it there were two small rectangular windows on either side of the door. The right window had a small curtain and the left side was being covered with a small decorative tree. The small curtain had a gap in between of it because it was glued under the window from the top area to the bottom area, leaving the middle part loose. At the moment of the bangs, it caused the middle area of the curtain to puff slowly and then quickly press against the window, leaving it wrinkled. After that, we were all silent. All of us were terrified. My aunt denied being scared, but at the moment I could see nothing but fear in her face. I wanted to run upstairs to get my parents, but I was too afraid to go up the stairs because it was right in front of the door. All I could do was text and call them, but they were too deep in their slumber to hear their phones ring. My aunt told the two of us to calm down and dismissed it as the wind. We all knew it couldn't have been, but in order to stay calm, she made up that excuse. And I must say that it was totally cliché. The next morning, I told my mother about the previous events. She brushed it off by saying it must have been a bear or a deer. Another cliché thing to say. We both went outside to inspect and found my mom's decorations near the front of the door thrown off to the side. There were no scratch marks or bumps on the door. Everything seemed normal except for her decorations lying on their side. When the three of us looked at the door the night of the event, there wasn't anything that would have caught our attention. Since the woods were 40 meters away from the house, we would have heard the trees moving with the wind, but we heard nothing. The movie was playing at the time, but it was strange how we all felt the sudden urge to look at the door almost as if we knew that something was about to happen. The bangs were extremely loud and caused me to jump up from the couch. It couldn't have been kids playing a prank on us because I'd been living there for about three years and nothing like that had ever happened. Plus I knew the neighbors well enough to know they'd never do such a thing like that. There were exactly three bangs, one after the other one, and it honestly could have caused the door to fly out of place, but thank God it didn't. What about the curtain? The only explanation we could come up with was that the impact of the bangs created the wind causing the curtain to react that way, but why did it inflate slowly if the bangs were rapid and then suddenly cause it to go against the window so fast after the bangs were over? My aunt thinks that the wind must have knocked off its course, that's why we didn't hear the trees moving, and created huge columns of wind that must have caused the door to move so much? The gust of wind must have gotten inside the house from the cracks of the door, leading the curtain to puff up. Personally, it doesn't make sense and sounds like total BS to me. She also mentioned she saw a shadow outside, but she doesn't have an explanation for that. I didn't see a shadow outside, though. My mother came up with an excuse as well. She said it might have been a deer or a bear, but why would a deer or a bear bang their head or entire body, for that matter, into the door? 
Like I previously said, there were no scratch marks to, to prove it was an animal, and no animal could have caused those three loud bangs. We've had deer sightings in that neighborhood before, but none that have acted in such a strange behavior. Usually they would all run back into the woods. Bears are out of the question. Not once have there been sightings of them. I should also mention that we had the lights from the outside on. Why would an animal come that close to a house, especially a door that is clearly being illuminated by a light? Like I said before, animals in general are out of the question. As I mentioned before, my aunt, along with my mother, have experienced many unexplained events and they believe in the paranormal. I think the only reason they tried to make up an excuse for this situation was to prevent me from becoming paranoid and afraid. It's pretty late for that now since I've had my share of experiences as well. Now to my aunt's friend. My aunt told me that when her friend was younger, she suffered from really bad night terrors. She said she saw things, demonic entities as she described them. She'd wake up screaming and crying. It was traumatizing for her. Her family had always been religious and they prayed for her every night and slowly those things haunting her went away as she grew up. That really creeped me out and led me to believe that she might have brought or attracted this thing to my house or maybe it could have been something else. I hope this never happens to me again. Please let me know if you guys think it might have been the wind that could have caused those three extremely loud knocks at my door or an animal or some kind of creature. The 1892 Bitterroot Mountains Sighting Researched and written by Montana's own Greg Strandberg One interesting story comes to us from former President Teddy Roosevelt. Our 26th president was quite the accomplished writer, penning 35 books during his lifetime. One of those was 1892's The Wilderness Hunter. The Wilderness Hunter by Teddy Roosevelt referred to a goblin story that quite impressed him. The story had originally been told to Roosevelt by a man named Bauman, a weather-beaten old mountain hunter that had passed all of his life on the frontier. Bauman told a story of he and his trapping partner heading out among the mountains dividing the forks of the salmon from the head of Wisdom River. They didn't have much luck there and moved through a particularly wild and lonely pass, one with a bad reputation due to the death of a trapper the year before. The man had been slain seemingly by a wild beast, the half-eaten remains being afterwards found by some mining prospectors. Bauman and his partner knew the tales but went up into the pass anyways, about four hours up into it. There, they reached a little open glade and made camp. Since there was a bit of daylight left, the two men headed upstream and looked for beaver to trap. When they got back to camp, it was clear that something had visited their camp and had rummaged about among their things, scattered the items in their packs and destroyed their lean-to. The men set about restoring their camp and then, now dark, they took a look at the footprints. They'd figured that a bear had done the destruction, but upon closer examination, something wasn't right. Bauman, the other trapper said, coming back into camp after following the tracks off into the forest a ways, using a single stick from the fire to light his way. That bear has been walking on two legs. The two men checked the tracks, came to the conclusion that something was quite odd, and then turned in for the night. Around midnight, Bauman was awakened by some noise and sat up. He smelled a strong, wild beast odor, 
and he caught the loom of a great body in the darkness at the mouth of the lean-to. Reaching for his rifle, Bauman managed to get a shot off. Whatever the thing had been went crashing back through the woods. The men slept little the rest of that night, then set about checking their traps the next day. They stayed close together. Upon returning from their work, they found the same ransacked camp as the day before. Again there were footprints. Again they appeared to be left by something on two legs. Roosevelt recounts what happened next. The men, thoroughly uneasy, gathered a great heap of dead logs and kept up a roaring fire throughout the night. One or the other sitting on guard most of the time. About midnight, the thing came down through the forest opposite, across the brook, and stayed there on the hillside for nearly an hour. They could hear the branches crackle as it moved about, and several times it uttered a harsh, grating, long-drawn moan, a peculiarly sinister sound. Yet it did not venture near the fire. The next morning, the men decided to get out of there. They still had to gather their traps, however, so set about doing so. All through the morning, the two had the disagreeable sensation of being followed. There'd be the occasional snap of a twig, the slight rustling of pines and the dancing shadows that sunlight through the trees can create. The men were on edge, no doubt about it. They headed back to camp for a noon meal and thought things out. There were still three traps over yonder on a little pond near a wide ravine. Bauman said he'd head on out and get them, leaving his friend to pack up the rest of their belongings. There were three beavers awaiting Bauman when he arrived and being the good trapper he was, he set about cleaning the furs right then and there. It took longer than he thought it would, and by the time he started back, the sun was already beginning to set. Bauman set off back toward camp. He headed through the forest, sunlight reflecting strangely, little breeze about, and the gloomy stillness which always broods over these somber primeval forests. Finally, he reached the edge of camp. He called out, but no call was returned. Bauman began to feel uneasy. He could see the thin blue smoke still curling up from the now out campfire and the wrapped and arranged packs near it. Stepping closer, However, his eye fell upon the body of his friend, stretched beside the trunk of a great fallen spruce. Rushing towards it, the horrified trapper found that the body was still warm, but that the neck was broken, while there were four great fang marks in the throat. The footprints of the unknown beast creature printed deep in the soft soil told the whole story. The unfortunate man, having finished his packing, had sat down on the spruce log with his face to the fire and his back to the dense woods to wait for his companion. While thus waiting, his monstrous assailant, which must have been lurking in the woods, waiting for a chance to catch one of the adventurers unprepared came silently up from behind, walking with long noiseless steps and seemingly still on two legs. Evidently unheard, it reached the man and broke his neck by wrenching his head back with its forepaws while it buried its teeth in his throat. It had not eaten the body but apparently had romped 
and gambled about it in uncouth, ferocious glee, occasionally rolling over and over it, and had then fled back into the soundless depths of the woods. Bowman grabbed his rifle and got out of there, leaving everything else. He headed back down the pass as fast as he could, thinking something either half-human or half-devil, some great goblin beast, was after him. The horses were still grazing in the meadow, and he got him and got out of there, riding onwards through the night until beyond reach of pursuit. The Thing Had My Grandmother's Face, submitted by Scary Stuff, Scary Stuff, Scary Stuff. So this is a little paranormal story I had back when I was just 12 years old. During the summer of my 7th grade year, me and my family decided to take a trip up to Alabama to visit my grandfather's estate. My grandfather had just recently passed away due to a massive heart attack. So unsurprisingly, my family was very distraught. My mother was will executor, so she was in charge of the estate and taking inventory of all my grandfather's belongings. As we pull up to the house, I get an eerie feeling. To give a little perspective on the setting, I will describe the house. The house is located in a whiter trash neighborhood filled with druggies and weirdos. A couple years after the visit, the house would be broken into and the copper from the wiring in the house would be stolen. So that gives kind of an idea of the scumbags my father had living around him. The house itself kind of looked like the house from the Amityville horror movie. It was two stories with a basement. It had three bedrooms and two baths at the top floor and one bedroom and one bath in the basement. It had wood floors and the ceiling was unpainted. The only place in the house where the ceilings were somewhat painted was in my grandparents' bedroom. It had an X pattern and a sequence of patterns across the ceiling. This bedroom was particularly big and had a bathroom in it. It is also the room my grandfather died in. My grandfather was 6'7 and 300 pounds, so I had guessed that was what had attributed to his heart attack. The house's exterior was made of wood and sat on 10 acres of land, another 100 acres if you count the land that was leased. The land was littered with old rusty cars that my grandfather used to collect parts off of. The inside of the house was rustic and the furniture looked like it was bought from Goodwill. It smelled musty, a smell I can't really associate with too many other things. Just to be clear, I'm not knocking the house. My grandfather built the house with his bare hands, so I have a lot of respect for it. He and my grandmother had spent the first three years building the house and living in the basement. The basement, however, smelled even worse than the upstairs. It smelled like old, dead air. The kind of smell you would smell at an abandoned house in the middle of the woods. It had a kitchen, a living area, a bedroom, and a basement. I like to spend a lot of time down in the basement, snooping through a wide variety of items my grandfather had down here. From old radios to old police monitors, my grandfather had everything down here. On one particular day, my parents were outside taking inventory on the vast collection of mechanical parts, and I was snooping around in the basement. As I was down there, I started to hear noise above my head. It sounded like footsteps coming from my grandparents' bedroom. I figured it was one of my parents in there to get something. I shrugged it off and continued with my snooping. The sounds never went away though. It sounded like a crescendo starting off soft and gradually getting louder and then starting all over again. It sounded as if it were walking back and forth. I decided to go up and investigate the noise, but no one was up there. I was creeped out to say the least, so I joined my parents outside where I stayed for the rest of the day. Fast forward to nighttime and I was back in the house. I was forced to sleep in my grandparents' bedroom despite my protest. Luckily, I was sharing the room and the bed with my grandmother who happened to join my parents on the trip. My parents would sleep across the hall. Me and my mom got in some sort of argument and I was forced to go to bed early. I was in this creepy bedroom alone while my grandmother was right outside the bedroom in the living room. She was watching TV. Despite the noise coming from the TV outside the bedroom, the bedroom was extremely quiet. It seemed to take on an aura of its own. The bed faces the door going out to the living room and the bathroom door sat on the right side of the bed. So here I was in this creepy bedroom laying on my back in bed. As I was laying there I began thinking about the footsteps I had heard earlier in the day. Didn't like it in that bedroom. The air inside the room seemed suffocating. 
As I was laying in the bed, I heard a noise inside the bathroom. I lay there motionless with my head turned towards the bathroom. My eyes were locked on that closed door. This bathroom wasn't big at all, it was like the size of a storage closet. I will never forget the noise that I was hearing from that bathroom. It sounded like a gargling sound. It sounded like a choking gargling sound. I really can't explain how scared I was. I just lay there paralyzed with fear. Several seconds went by, although it felt like hours before the sounds quit. It fell silent again, even more silent than before. I was still too scared to move. I wanted to scream out to my grandma, but I couldn't bring myself to do so. I rolled over on my side so I can permanently keep my eyes on that door. A few minutes went by before I started to notice something again. The door handle on the door was slowly moving from one side to the other, as if someone were trying to open it but couldn't bring themselves to do so. I just stared in complete horror. My mouth was hanging wide open. The latch on the door went through the stop, and the door began to creep open. It was an inward swinging wood frame door so it would be opening away from me. As the door began to open, all I could think was that I had to get out of there, but I couldn't bring myself to do so. The door opened about halfway before it had stopped abruptly. It was dark in the room, but the TV from the living room outside illuminated the room a little bit. The door opened about halfway before it stopped abruptly. It was dark in the room, but the TV from the living room outside illuminated the room a little bit. I could see a dark shadow moving around in the bathroom. I couldn't quite make out the shape of it. It looked eternally dark, sort of like a black hole of darkness. All of a sudden, a face popped out of that darkness. I was horrified. It was my deceased grandmother. Her head and face were showing, but not her body. It was almost as if she were peeking out at me. I was even more worded out by how close to the floor her head was. It was about an inch underneath the door jam. Her long, mullet-like gray hair hung to the side and her thick seeing glasses just about covered her whole face. Words can't even begin to describe how terrified I was. I contemplated getting out of bed and running out of the room, but the thought of my grandmother reaching out, grabbing my leg, and pulling me to my doom quickly pushed this thought out of my mind. So I just laid there and stared at her. She stared back at me and then she began to smile. Oh God, that smile. That smile let me know one thing. That wasn't my grandmother. I don't know who or what that thing was, but it wasn't my grandmother. That smile had dry, caked on blood surrounding it. It was pure evil. The head began to move its way up, past the door jam until it finally stopped at the top of the door, which had to be seven feet high, its eyes never leaving mine. It began to creep its way from the side all the way to the middle of the doorway, its dark body just about covering the whole door. I couldn't stand any longer. I closed my eyes and screamed louder than I'd ever screamed before, over and over and over again. Finally, my dad burst through the doorway, followed by my mother and grandmother. A wave of panic filled their faces as they flicked on the light and looked at my face. I was pale white and staring into space. They began questioning me as to what was wrong, but I said nothing. Eventually, they calmed me down enough where I could finally tell them what happened. They first looked at each other and then back at me. I could tell they were skeptical, but scared at the same time. My father went and checked out the bathroom. Of course, there was nothing in it. My mother finally moved me out of the room into a different bedroom on the other side of the house. I never heard anything else about this incident from my parents. I'm not even sure they believe me. All I know is that writing about this 10 years later still gives me the creeps and sends chills down my spine. Probably because of one disturbing fact that I learned a couple of years later from the incident when the house finally sold. My grandmother didn't just die, she committed suicide in that very bedroom that I was staying in. A gunshot to the chest. I was very close to my grandmother, so I know that she wouldn't do anything to scare me like that. So whatever that thing was, I hope I never meet it again. After learning my grandmother's suicide and that demon I met in her bedroom, I eventually came to a revelation. I believe my grandfather had an unseen factor that contributed to his heart attack. That monster that I encountered in the bedroom is the culprit that had gone unnoticed and ultimately led to my grandfather's demise. The Walk, submitted by Aspiring Waffle. Preface. 
I'm a 23-year-old woman, and I am half Cherokee from Georgia, USA. At the time that this story took place, my fiancé and I were living on a large farm in Maryland. We didn't use the farm, but we were renting a small house on the property, and we were free to come and go around the grounds. I was only 19 at the time this took place, and the only residents in our home were myself, my fiancé, and our cat and dog. Our cat was a lunatic barn cat that I had rescued because I can't say no to animals that need help. And our dog was my loyal pit bull, who was a sweet, cuddly, scaredy cat. She weighed about 75 pounds and is afraid of her own shadow. Our farm was situated on about 20 acres of land, and our driveway was about a half a mile long. So usually when I would get home from work, my loyal dog and I would go for a walk, and I usually brought my fiancé with me. Not that I was afraid to go out alone, just that he spends too much time playing games and not using his legs. After our driveway was a 12 mile long road through woods and farms until it finally reconnected with civilization. So it was safe to say that we were far, far from other people, except our landlord of course. The first miles were through open farmland, followed by a brief patch of forest and then about a half a mile of wheat fields and then solid forests for two more miles. Now that you have a bit of the layout, on to the creepy bit. My fiancé and I returned home from work to our happy cottage and happy pets. Harley, our dog, was frantic to go for a walk, so I quieted her and changed into walking clothes and asked if my fiancé would join me. He had gotten home shortly after me and said he had seen one of the coyotes that we have around close to the field by our house, but as you may know, coyotes are mostly scavengers, especially out here on the East Coast, so I wasn't too worried, and I'm very capable of defending myself. I called him a wuss and then told Harley that we could go out and that we would be fine without him. Laughing to myself, we left the cottage and started walking down the driveway. The sun was going down and the October air had started to get a chill to it and it rustled through the corn fields next to our driveway. The corn was about six feet tall at this point in the year and impossible to see through so I assume my fiancé was just trying to scare me because there was no way he could have seen a coyote in this field. Harley was enjoying her time in the field, tearing in and out of the corn stalks on her walk up the driveway, and I knew that with as big of a coward as she was, she would alert me to any danger very quickly and by running away. By the time I reached the end of the driveway, the sun had set and the moon, which had already come out, was shining high above the fields. It wasn't quite full, but it provided enough light that I didn't need to use my flashlight or Harley's collar light. We turned down the road and proceeded across the first section of field, the first field was soybeans, and if you don't know, they are relatively short plants that nothing but a rabbit could hide in. And off in the distance I spotted a few deer, but nothing alarming, so we relaxed and enjoyed our walk through the night air. I threw a stick, and Harley brought it back over and over again, typical dog and owner stuff. We reached the first small section of trees, and Harley stopped and bumped into my leg, letting me know that something was ahead. It wasn't a coyote or a deer, but there was a rabbit that had been hit by a passing car and was still struggling. As much as I hate to say this, there was no way it was going to live, and honestly, it's probably what drew the coyote pack in. I knelt down by it, and using my knife, quickly put it out of its misery as my family had taught me, and let it pass into the next life. Feeling sad, but somewhat relieved that all we had encountered was a handful of deer and that poor rabbit, we continued our walk and passed into the next field. This was a wheat field, and the wheat was about ready for harvest, so it was quite tall and hard to see through. The field was quiet though and Harley didn't do anything so I figured the coyotes had passed on if there had ever been any at all. Now this is the part you have been waiting for and I don't know what it is but here it is. We rounded the corner of the field and into an area with wheat on our left and forest on our right and the air seemed to go still. Harley got closer to me and I heard rustling in the wheat field. I saw three tails circling back toward the forest. Coyotes. The eastern coyotes are small, but in a pack they get pretty ballsy. Harley raised her hackles and I yelled, Get out of here! Go on! Fuck off! As loud as I could, and the coyotes, startled, scattered off into the trees. I decided to turn around and get out of there before they decided to regroup, because I am brave, but I'm not going to walk into a darkened forest with a coyote pack and a cowardly pit bull. We turned to head back, and again I heard a rustling in the wheat. A confused coyote? I thought it must be, but no. Harley was standing stock still, staring at the wheat, and I whistled for her to come with me. That high-pitched, ear-piercing, two-fingered whistle? That snapped her out of it for a second, when my whistle was returned from inside the wheat. All of a sudden, all of the family legends I had heard came flooding back to me, and I expected to see a tall, thin creature emerge, 
but nothing did. I didn't smell rotting meat or feel a sense of dread. Instead, I was transfixed with fear and curiosity. I whistled again. The whistle was returned again, very human-sounding, but at the same time, not. Against my better judgment, I said, Hello? My own voice replied, Hello? My hand on my knife, I said, Show yourself! Silence. No bugs, no coyotes, no Harley noises. Just my own breath. Slowly the rustling started again, and I turned on my flashlight. I shined it on the wheat field, and what I saw confuses me to this day. Animal eyes! That green-yellow reflection of light was cast back at me, but what it was connected to didn't make sense. There was a girl, no more than 14 or 16, crouched in the wheat. She wore what I think must have been some kind of deerskin or fur, and she was naked otherwise. She was very thin and looked as though her skin had never seen sunlight. Her hair was long and tangled with wheat and leaves, and under any other circumstances, I would have said she was beautiful. But at that moment, she was terrifying. We stared at each other for what must have been a solid minute or so, but felt like much longer until I heard an unmistakable coyote howl from the forest. Both of our heads snapped toward the noise, and immediately I heard her take off through the wheat towards the sound. At that same moment, Harley took off toward our house, and I went after her. We didn't stop running until we got to the driveway, and I stopped, not wanting my fiancé to know I was running away from something. I could still hear the howling in the distance, and we started walking at a brisk pace. We made it back to the cottage with no further problems. I didn't tell my fiancé about it, not wanting him to go out with a gun. She hadn't hurt me, so I didn't think it right to hunt her. I was awoken in the middle of the night that night by the sound of the coyotes outside our cottage. This wasn't usual, but now I wondered if she was with them. When I was coming home from work about a month later, I had stopped obsessing about that night, and I almost thought I had imagined it when I had to slam on the brakes for something in the road. It was dark, and when my headlights hit it, its eyes reflected green and yellow. It was a large coyote. It had just stared at my car for a moment and ran off into the woods. I know this sounds crazy, but I still wonder if that was her. Skunk Ape Encounter by Wow Such Titan So, back in November 2017, me and my family made the trip from the UK to Florida as part of the first leg of our two-week-long final family vacation before we kids moved out and get on with our own lives. We did Disneyland, Universal, all that typical touristy stuff. Not relevant to the story, but whatever. My dad is massively into cryptids and conspiracies and all that jazz, and for the entire time kept driving my mum insane with stories of the skunk ape that is known to frequent the woods of Florida. It just so happens that the holiday estate we were staying at in Kissimmee, Florida, backed right onto one of these. Aside from a few roads, it's pretty much swamp, marsh, and forest for the next 20 to 30 miles. On perhaps the fifth day of our holiday, it was late in the evening and me and my dad were watching TV in the lounge of our villa whilst my mom and my sister chilled out in the backyard. Suddenly, we started hearing tapping on the glass of the sliding door leading into the garden. It was my sister beckoning for me to come outside. So I get up and investigate and as soon as I step outside, I'm hit with this strong smell that I can only describe as a very, very musky, wet ferret. I ask my mom and sister, WTF is that smell? And they go on to explain that they were just chilling, enjoying the sound of the crickets and cool evening air, when suddenly they got hit by the strong feeling that something was watching them. They then noticed that the crickets went dead silent. Then the smell that I smelt hit them. 
This only lasted for about 30 seconds before the feeling subsided and the crickets started chirping again. It was then that my sister started knocking on the glass for me. We relay this to my dad and suddenly he's like a kid in a candy store telling us it must have been the skunk ape. I only got to smell whatever it was, but after I started talking with my sister about the incident, she said it almost felt like something intelligent was watching them. My mom is still a firm skeptic and says it was probably just an alligator. We had a lot of these chilling at the holiday estate, walking past with something dead in its mouth. But dead things or alligators don't smell like a thousand extremely smelly wet dogs. Included is a picture of where it happened. The villa itself was being built when the Google satellites did their thing, so it's not there. But I kind of figured out the general area. What do you guys think? Mayray's Flock Monster by Hormule One and Mayray. I've lived in a small rural town north of the states on the border of Canada for the majority of my life. Growing up, I had a friend named Mary, but her accent changed it to Mayray. Ironically enough, her family bred and sold sheep for a living. When we were old enough to wander into the meadows and play with the sheep, we often would do so, keeping her St. Bernard's, Gus, and Goliath with us for safety. One early summer morning, a few weeks after the last lambing of the flock was finished, we set out to find and befriend the newest little one hidden away in a small wooded area at the back of her property. The sheep liked their privacy when they were lambing, but typically their privacy was an illusion due to the amount of predators in said woods waiting for them to single themselves out. We would sometimes find coyote or bobcat victims slaughtered and thrown about the paths, blood showered everywhere in the struggle. Rarely the killer would be something larger, probably a cougar, caching the newborn and the mother in trees. We would find it hanging there in the fork of the branches, wedged by its head and its stomach torn open with massive blood-soaked holes in its throat. On this day in particular, one of the two was still alive, we didn't know yet if it was the mother or the lamb, but we knew it was hurt badly. It was bleeding and screaming louder than we had ever heard. The dogs chased after the noise as we followed quickly to the site. I wish we hadn't. We found at first glance a fresh cougar kill, but something was off. The lamb lay wedged in the forks of limbs like always, dead as a doornail, blood gushing out of it and a fresh pool flooding the earth below. The mother was also wedged between some limbs, her horns keeping her from shaking loose, her back legs twisted at odd angles. On her exposed underbelly, just a few days shorn for a cleaner birth, was a deep, precise gash from her neck to her arse, then a horizontal cut from foreleg to foreleg with the corners of her shoulder flesh pulled and folded neatly, upward exposing the muscle. The intestines knotted with afterbirth twisting out of her belly, up around her neck, still having enough reach to almost touch the ground. Dogs were going haywire when I noticed there was virtually no blood anywhere else in the entire area. I looked back at the lamb to see its throat hadn't been punctured, nor was any part of it wounded, but there was fresh blood still gushing out of it. The neck was broken, hanging abnormally long and swinging eerily from the commotion of the dogs and mother rattling the trees. Mireille walked closer to the lamb, trying to see where the blood was coming from. from. From what we could tell, it wasn't coming from one place in particular. It was bleeding out of every single pore on its body, out of its ears, eyes, nose, and mouth as well. We stared, horrified and confused, about how the hell this could possibly happen when we heard distant yelping, snapping us off the attention of the lamb to see Gus and Goliath were gone, in pain somewhere in the distant woods, but not too far to run, so without thinking, we followed the noise to see. Without thinking, we followed the noise to see Gus motionless in a bloody pool and Goliath standing over him. Over Goliath, however, was something so horrifying, I don't even know how to properly explain it. It was a red-brown, scab color, tall with long arms and huge claws that would compare to that of a bear. It looked starving. The head was like a deer, but longer, like an anteater with no ears and a mane like a horse's. But the hair was very thin and ragged. It stood on its hind legs that bent backwards awkwardly. It had to use the trees for support with one hand. The fingers, just as long, was the claws on the tips. The hands themselves would resemble a human hand with those origami claws on each finger. It was wheezing out of breath as if it had bronchitis or pneumonia. 
Goliath ran towards it and using its free hand, it grabbed him by the neck, lifting him easily off the ground, yelping. The hand clutching the tree slipped off casually, and the monster tossed its shoulder onto it, leaning on said tree, then ran its claw gently down the dog, caressing it, stopping just below its neck and plunged the tip of its nail in, the dog screaming horrified as it tore a surgical hole down his belly, then hung him on the limb as its head shot in our direction, turning to us as its dark, hollow eyes narrowed. Frozen, we watched it take a step. It wheezed out a piercing wail like a wolf's howl mixed with nails on a chalkboard, mixed with the pain screams of a rabbit emitted out of its small hole of a mouth. Then I blacked out. I woke up at home with May Ray, not knowing what happened. Most of my memory would return later, but what happened after that thing turned towards us would need to be told to me by May Ray. Apparently we ran and hid, with it chasing us all over through the woods until we hit the edge. Then it stopped. We continued running until we got to her house, crying. We tore open the door to her house and then to her room, and then I fainted on her floor, exhausted. She tried to explain to her parents, but they didn't believe the story, said it was a bear or something. Mourned the loss of the dogs, then began building a large fence a few weeks later. It's been a few years, and neither of us know what it was. It didn't resemble the behavior or look of a Wendigo or a rake very well, but we both remember the experience vividly. The Creature That Almost Caught Us by The Chainsaw Killer This happened directly to me. At the time of the story, I was a 12-year-old male who lived in California. For a summer trip, me and my family flew to Boise, Idaho for a week to stay with cousins. We stayed at their house for two days, and then came the best part. It was the best part, until what happened, that is. On the third day, we drove to a small city in the Rocky Mountains of central Idaho. They owned a cabin in Ketchum. The first day was fishing at nearby lakes, playing games, and meeting a few of the neighbors on the small street. Everyone we met was nice. It was amazing. I thought nothing could go wrong. Before I say more, here's a layout of the area. The room where I slept was at the back of the house. There was no fence at the back of the backyard because it was on the bank of a freezing cold river. Directly on the other side of the river was a huge mountain covered by a thick forest of pine trees. A small path starts out on the other side of the river, but there's no bridge. There is one a quarter of a mile down the road in front of our house. I went to bed that night. I woke up at 2 a.m. needing to use the bathroom. I got up and did my thing, then headed back to my room. As I got into bed, I felt hot, so I opened my window. Not 15 minutes after I opened my window, I heard the most terrifying screech come from the forest. It was raspy, but high-pitched. I know for a fact it wasn't human. I've heard stories from horror narrators on YouTube channels that often describe creatures that make weird noises that sound sort of human, but aren't. I heard it once more, but this time closer. In the morning when I woke up, we explored around town. At 7 p.m., me, my sister, and my cousins got permission from our parents to go explore the forest. It was uneasy considering I had heard creepy, human-like noises in the night, and it was nearing night. The oldest cousin, Alex, who was 16, took a loaded pistol, a lighter and a backpack full of snacks. I carried a hunting knife and a flashlight. The cousin my age, Julia, took just a flashlight. My sister, Brianna, and the other cousin, Karina, who were 10, took some extra batteries and a small bag of candy each. We made our way across the bridge at the end of the street and back to the path on the side of the river across from the house. All of us began the hike to the top of the mountain. We made it to the top of Bald Mountain in an hour and a half. The view from 9,000 feet was incredible. At 8.55, Alex and I figured it was time to head down and ordered the group to the path. At this point, it was dark now and the sun had fully set. Julia and I turned on our flashlights and shined them ahead as we walked. Some halfway down the mountain, which was about 45 minutes into the walk, I got the dreadful feeling you get when you're being watched and followed. Seconds later, something that was hiding in the bushes a few yards into the tree line that bordered the path ran off on our right. I brushed it off as some type of small animal. About five minutes after the incident, what we heard made me tingle with fear and my heart dropped to my stomach. That same horrifying screech from last night echoed through the forest from a, from a mile or two away. I told everyone we needed to move faster, and we did. It went off again, but closer. Again. Closer. Whatever that thing was, it was moving faster than us. We were full-on speed walking by then. That still wasn't fast enough because soon the screeching stopped, and we heard loud steps 30 yards off to the right. I got that feeling of being watched again. Alex took his gun and fired two shots in the general direction of the steps. The creature backed off, but even though we thought he was gone, 
I still sensed we were being watched. As the river came into sight, it caught me and everyone else by surprise. I heard the path gravel crunching behind us. I looked back, and in the darkness, I saw the outline of something that resembled a human on the path behind us, with about 200 yards of distance between us. I told Alex, and his face went pale when he looked. We told the rest of the group quietly, and on three, we all broke out into a run towards the river. Whatever that thing was, it was extremely fast. When we reached the river, there wasn't time to get to the bridge a quarter of a mile farther along the river because this thing was catching up fast. We jumped in and swam across the ice-cold water. It got to the river just as we made it to the bank and into the backyard. Julia and I shined our flashlights and finally got a good look at it. It was a massive, hairy creature that was about seven feet tall. It had huge, razor-sharp claws like a bear's. Its eyes glowed red when the flashlight shined on them. Alex shot at it and it darted off with one final screech. We all looked at each other in pure terror, shock, and surprise. Alex explained everything to our parents. They didn't know what to make of it and had never heard of anything like it. I'm thankful nothing happened to us and that I noticed the creature behind us. If I hadn't, one of the others might not have noticed it until it was too late. The next time I stay at that cabin, I am not going alone into those woods at night. The Creature by Queen of Horror 666 This is in a female point of view. To give you a little insight about me, this story happened when I was 14 years old. I was at my friend Emily's house since back then I lived there for personal reasons. Anyway, it was about 1 a.m. and her parents were gone for the night at her grandma's house. We were watching horror movies and vegging out on snacks like we usually would every weekend night. After our movie, I got up to pee and let her know I'd be back. She nodded before opening up her laptop to message her boyfriend at the time. As I walked down her barely lit hallway and came across the bathroom, I heard Emily's voice call out to me to her back porch that was on the right side of the hallway which immediately struck me as odd because I never saw her leave the room or even walk past me and why would she be outside anyway? Her voice called to me again so I couldn't help but walk out to the back porch. It took a lot to scare me so I wasn't bothered by this. Turned out to be the biggest mistake ever. A red flag should have went off right then and there when her voice became silent as I stepped onto the porch. I called her name softly, but she didn't reply. I called her name once more, but this time louder. And again, silence. I stepped off the porch onto the grass, looking into her wooded backyard. A little irritated now because at the time I figured she was trying to prank scare me like she usually did. It was normal for her. But when I yelled her name again, a voice spoke, but it wasn't hers. It was another woman's voice. Help me, please, for the love of God, help me, I heard a woman scream. Okay, now I was officially freaked out because there was no one around for miles besides her one neighbor that lives a little ways into the woods. I found myself not being able to move. Curiosity, maybe? But the bushes started rustling and what looked like a dog stepped out. My first thought it was her neighbor's dog that must have gotten out again because it had happened before. But when this thing stood up on its hind legs, it was about seven feet tall. That's when I really froze up. What the hell was this thing? I asked myself. I never met any human that's that tall in my entire life. When it started to stalk towards me, I eyed it carefully. It was walking kind of human-like, but a wobbly like a baby taking its first steps. I found myself not being able to bolt out of there like I should have. I couldn't move. That is until I heard the slider door being opened and the real Emily's voice speak. Lana, what are you doing out here? I looked around my whole house for you. 
As soon as she finished her sentence, I bolted as fast as I could and pulled my friend inside before shutting the door and locking it while closing the blinds. I did this to every room, even the basement, locking windows included. All the while, Emily yelling at me, asking me what the hell was going on. I took her arm and raced into her room before slamming her door behind us. When she finally realized how terrified I was and how badly I was shaking, only then did she ask me, Jesus, Lana, what's the matter? You look like you've seen a ghost. What the hell happened? She asks. I finally calmed down enough to begin telling her what I encountered, but before I got the chance to fully explain what happened, I heard extreme banging on my friend's window, which stunned us both, and we both shot up at least ten feet in the air. I whispered, oh, hell, when I realized I forgot to shut her blinds. I didn't have the heart to turn around, but when Emily's face went pale, I didn't have a choice but to look behind me. I really wish I hadn't. There, that thing was. Looking into our bedroom window, I couldn't even begin to explain what it looked like. All I can come up with is that its body was twisted like someone had just been in a freakish car accident and it had fur, lots of it, and the eyes glowed much like a cat. A high-pitched noise escaped that thing's throat, making us not only cover our ears, but we both screamed as hard as our lungs would let us. I threw my friend on the floor before zooming into her parents' room to get her dad's 42 rifle. But when I came back, the noise stopped and that creature was gone. Emily was rocking back and forth, holding her knees close to her, shaking and crying hysterically. She had seen its face as clear as I did. And the antlers that it happened to have? To say we were absolutely terrified would be a major understatement. The rest of the night we had all the lights on in the house and we stayed huddled together in the living room with the rifle right under my legs. Finally, after what seemed like decades, the sun rose and her parents walked through the door. Almost instantly, her dad noticed our fear-stricken expressions and his gun under my legs. They sat down and softly asked us what happened. When I explained it, they shared worried glances before announcing that we were moving. We never asked why. We were just happy to get the hell out of there. To this day, I don't know if it was a skinwalker that some people believe in, or if it was an imposter. What I do know, though, is that it was not human. Terror in the Wilderness In the deep, cold winters of the rugged Rocky Mountain wilderness and across the northern United States into Alberta, Canada, Stories tell of starvation winters, of creatures that roam the remote backwoods, and of the poor souls who have fallen victim to their fellow humans. Tales of murder, cannibalism, and greed spread through the westernmost regions of Montana, too, across the scenic Bitterroot Selway wilderness into Idaho. The road through the wilderness area, even today, is one of the nation's most dangerous and remote. In hard times, when wind and snow block the mountain passes and cover the trails and game is scarce, a terrible fate can befall those who travel here. At these times, hunger can drive a person to do unspeakable things. Native American stories warn that the Wendigo roams the northern regions from the Atlantic Ocean to the Rocky Mountains and as far north as the Arctic Ocean, hungry for human flesh. Most northern Native American tribes have tales 
explaining how a human can turn Wendigo or Wendigo by an act of cannibalism through the presence of a demon, through a dream, or by the sorcery of a shaman. The Wendigo symbolizes the phantom of hunger that stalks the forests of the north as a shape-changing spirit with a heart of ice. In times of starvation, the Wendigo story served as a deterrent to cannibalism, a taboo forbidden even when it would save one's life. Suicide or resignation to death was preferable to turning Wendigo. Assiniboine and Crees even performed a Wendigo ceremony in times of famine to reinforce this taboo. Elders taught their children to behave or the Wendigo would come for them. From Algernon Blackwood's powerful 1910 short story, The Wendigo, to Stephen King's 1983 Pet Cemetery, the mythical creature has been popularized in contemporary literature, movies, comic books, and video games. But the idea is not entirely frivolous. Anthropologists have studied a phenomenon called Wendigo psychosis. There are historical cases of this condition. It results when a person under dire circumstances dines on a fellow human and afterwards develops an insatiable taste for human flesh. One famous documented case was that of Swift Runner, a Plains Cree trapper in Alberta, Canada, who butchered and ate his wife and five children, even though the starving family was within 25 miles of food at Hudson's Bay Post. Swift Runner, suffering from this psychosis, became a homicidal cannibal. He later confessed and was executed by hanging at Fort Saskatchewan in 1879. A remnant of the belief in Montana's Bitterroot Valley has come down through the story of Sleeping Child Hot Springs. The springs and a small creek south of Hamilton are the subject of several legends. One story dates to 1877 when Chief Joseph and his band of Nez Perce came over Lolo Pass into the Bitterroot Valley fleeing the U.S. Army. They split into two groups that traveled separate routes. One group followed a small creek and discovered a beautiful hot springs. Fearing there could be a battle with the pursuing soldiers, they left their infants at the springs where the lush vegetation along the banks could hide them. No confrontation materialized and they returned some hours later. They found the children well protected and sleeping peacefully and so named the creek and hot springs Sleeping Child. A much older legend, however, tells a different story. The name of the beautiful hot springs and creek was originally Weeping Child. Indians of long ago told about how travelers who passed near the springs would hear a child's pitiful crying. The sound would draw their attention and they would seek out the source. Upon discovering a child weeping uncontrollably along the bank, the travelers would take pity, lifting the child in their arms. The child was starving, and the traveler would offer his finger as a pacifier. But the child greedily sucked until all the flesh was gone from the finger and then from his arm. Finally, when the child had sucked all the flesh from the traveler's body, the bones would fall to the ground. The child would then disappear and lie in wait for another unsuspecting traveler to share the same fate. The hunger was never satiated, and there was a great pile of bones of all the victims at Weeping Child Hot Springs. 
Local settlers renamed the springs and creek Sleeping Child, thinking it a better name for such a pastoral place. The western edge of Montana's Ravalli County follows the southern half of the Bitterroot Mountain Range across the border into eastern Idaho. Heavy forests and high mountain passes have a long cultural heritage and sometimes a dark past. Scarred trees in this area of western Montana and eastern Idaho are indicative of travel corridors that native people used seasonally. Majestic ponderosa pines and, less often, western larch and other types of trees of great age served as a source of nutrition in the spring when the sap was running. Food was scarce at this time of the year, and the people were hungry. Various tribes harvested the sweet inner layer of the bark, or cambium, and dried it like jerky. Harvesting cambium did not kill the trees, but did leave scars. Lewis and Clark noted the practice of peeling bark in their journals, and some scarred trees still standing today were harvested as long ago as the 1700s. Nez Perce Pass is one of these lonely routes long traveled by native people. When gold was discovered in Idaho in 1860 and 1861 and in Montana in 1862, Congress created the vast territory of Idaho in 1863 to include the western half of Montana. The territorial capital was at Lewiston, Idaho. Miners and traders used the southern Nez Perce Trail over the pass as the most direct route from Elk City, Idaho to Bannock and Virginia City, Montana. This route was a dangerous but well-traveled pack trail. In early fall of 1863, Elk City merchant Lloyd Magruder traveled this route to Virginia City to sell a load of goods. Magruder was a well-respected citizen recently chosen as Idaho Territory's congressional representative. His business venture to the mining camps of Montana was a great success, and he planned to return to Elk City with a load of gold dust. While Magruder was in Virginia City selling merchandise, his good friend, Hill Beachy, who ran the Luna House, a hotel and stage shop at Lewiston, Idaho, had a horrifying nightmare. In his dream, Magruder was returning from Virginia City with a fortune in gold dust. As Magruder and his companions camped west of Nez Perce Pass, thieves ambushed them and killed them in a horrible manner. This greatly disturbed Beachy. He told his wife about the dream, confiding his great worry and anxiety about his friend. Mrs. Beachy cautioned her husband not to talk about it or people would think he was crazy. Meanwhile, business in Bannock delayed Magruder's departure for Elk City. He finally set off in October 1863 with a large number of livestock and four companions. Four other travelers joined the group along the way. As Beachy's dream had foretold, the new travelers ambushed the original group west of Nez Perce Pass and killed all five. Magruder's skull was split with an axe and his companions were killed in like fashion or shot. The murderers gleefully spent the night cleaning up the carnage. They rolled the victims in blankets and threw them into a gorge 800 feet deep where wolves would take care of the remains. They burned the pack saddles, straps, rifles, pistols, and everything else they did not keep, gathered the melted metal in a sack, and threw it into the gorge. The 70 or more animals they did not need, they turned loose. A heavy snow was falling, and by the time the murderers left the next morning, everything lay under two feet of snow. 
there was not a sign of the grisly activity that had taken place the night before. They were certain no one could discover their terrible deeds. But as they made their way along the trail, the train of pack mules they had turned loose began to follow the tinkling bell of one of the horses as they had been well trained to do. The heartless murderers shot some of the animals but could not run them off. The mules kept following the tinkling bell. Finally, they drove the dozens of mules into a canyon and slaughtered them. In Lewiston, Beachy could not let go of the dream he believed to be a premonition of his friend's death. When Magruder and his party did not return at the appointed time, Beachy feared his dream had come true. Soon after, a group of four strangers came into Lewiston behaving in a suspicious manner. Beachy suspected these men had killed his friend. They bought tickets for the stage at Beachy's Luna House and left their horses with a local rancher. A youngster who had worked for Magruder recognized his saddle among the tack, and a horse left with the rancher matched a horse that had belonged to one of Magruder's companions. That was proof enough for Hill Beachy. Beachy hunted down the desperados following their trail to San Francisco, California, succeeded in having them arrested and brought them back to Lewiston. They stood trial and three of them were hanged on March 4th, 1864. These were the first legal hangings in Idaho territory. Hill Beachy later visited the site where Magruder and his four companions were killed. He recovered the gruesome remains frozen at the bottom of the gorge and buried them. The recovered gold was returned to Magruder's family. The remote 95-mile route the ill-fated merchant took over Nez Perce Pass is known today as the Magruder Corridor. It cuts through more than 3 million acres of wilderness as large as the combined states of Delaware and Rhode Island. Travel along this treacherous historic corridor offers breathtaking views unchanged for hundreds of years. Its spectacular beauty is a stark contrast to the ghastly fate that befell Magruder, his companions, and his pack train. In the deep dark of night, spirits surely wander along the trail that would have taken them home. While Hill Beachy's premonition and the human greed that brought about the end of the Magruder party are unfortunately real enough, not all believe the other long-ago tales told of Montana's remote places. Most of us would dismiss the Wendigo as a figment of the imagination. However, Theodore Roosevelt, in his book The Wilderness Hunter, tells a believable story. The book, first published in 1907, includes an incident Roosevelt heard in 1893 from a seasoned mountain man named Bauman who spent his entire life in the backwoods. Roosevelt commented that Bauman shuddered with such revulsion at certain points in his story that it was obvious that the veteran woodsman was telling the truth. Years before, Bauman and his partner were trapping in the mountains of western Montana, between the Salmon and the Big Hole Rivers. Not having much luck, they decided to follow a small stream through a pass that had a dangerous reputation. The previous year, a hunter had been killed in the area and partially eaten by some wild animal. A miner passing through had discovered the remains. The two trappers left their hobbled ponies in a grassy meadow and hiked in some distance. They made camp and set out through the dense forest. It was dark and dismal as they pushed through the tall pines and firs. Returning to camp, they found that something had paid them a visit, scattering their belongings. They thought it was a bear, 
until they found the tracks, apparently made not by paws, but by feet. Whoever or whatever it was walked on two, not four. That night, the men slept under a lean-to rolled up in their blankets. During the night, Bauman awakened suddenly. A terrible odor struck him, strong and gamey, like some wild beast. A huge form loomed in the shadows at the edge of camp. Bauman pointed his rifle and fired, but he seemed to have missed. The figure crashed through the woods. The next morning, the partners again went out trapping. When they returned, same as before, the camp had been ransacked, the ground marked with tracks of a two-legged beast. The two men were very uneasy and gathered plenty of wood to light a fire that they kept roaring all night. Each took turns keeping watch. As before, during the night, the creature came toward the camp, but the fire kept it at bay. For a long while, it kept its distance, several times uttering a grating, sinister moan. Bauman and his partner decided to collect their traps and move on the next day. All morning, they felt as if they were being watched. Two armed men, experienced in the woods, had no reason to be afraid, but they were. They had only three traps left to collect. Bauman volunteered to get them while his partner went back to pack up camp. It took longer than expected as Bauman found three beavers in the traps and had to stop and prepare them. He started back very uneasy. The forest seemed to close in on him and it was with a sense of dread that he reached the camp. Bauman called out. There was no response. Smoke curled up from the campfire. The packs were ready and everything was piled neatly. But there was no sign of the partner. Bauman shouted again, and the shout stuck in his throat. There, against a fallen log, was the body of his partner. His neck was broken and deep marks of a beast's fangs punctured his throat. The flesh was uneaten, but evidence showed that the killer had cavorted around the body, rolling on it over and over. Bauman stopped only to grab his rifle and fled. The monster in the story has traits some attribute to Sasquatch, others to the Wendigo, and still others to a less supernatural human murderer or wild animal. In recounting this incident, Roosevelt himself speculates that with time, the horror of the experience and dread of the unknown might attribute weird and elfin traits to some abnormally wicked and cunning wild beast. But whether this was so or not, no man can say. I think I have a Bigfoot problem. Submitted by Dark Raven. Throughout the days, we take our two dogs outside to their kennels so they can get out of the house for a while and run and play and such. These are not small dogs. One is a Black Lab Husky mix and the other one is a full-blooded Staffordshire Terrier. A pit bull. The kennels are placed at the edge of the yard near the woods. These woods are big, large enough to take a day to go hiking through them. Lately, when it gets dark, the dogs seem on edge. They will bark and whine toward the house to come in. At first, I figured they just wanted to get back into the house, but now I'm thinking they're actually scared. Three nights ago, when I went to get them, it was already dark, but we have a security light so it isn't pitch black or anything. I got to the front of the first kennel and noticed both dogs were being very quiet. They always bark at me excitedly when I go to get them, but they were dead silent. This weirded me out a little, but not to the point of being scared. I will admit there was a certain uneasiness in the air, though, something I can't explain, but it sort of felt 
electric, like I was about to be shocked. The longer I was there, the more uneasy I felt. I started getting the first dog, the lab, out and heard a heavy snap in the woods near the kennels. I froze. The dogs froze. By this time I was so on edge that if someone had spoken, I would have jumped, screamed, and possibly ran. The creepy feeling in the air just kept getting thicker. The lab had her bushy tail stuffed underneath her and was whining. This didn't make me feel any better. The pit bull was as far from the woods as she could get, whimpering for me to come get her. I could only take one dog in at a time because they get too excited and will sometimes try to fight, so I avoid that at all cost. I felt so bad leaving the pity there by herself, but I had to do it. As I walked away, she barked this high-pitched, whining type of bark at me that I have never heard her do before. The lab couldn't get to the house quick enough. I went back for the other one and dreaded every step as her door is right at the base of the woods. I would have to turn my back to the woods to open her door and get her out. The air felt heavy and stale with an unpleasant smell like a dead skunk as I approached the kennel. Another snap and I was about ready to run for it, but I didn't want to leave my dog who had her head down defensively facing the woods. I could barely make it. To be honest, it felt like trying to walk through water. I was terrified by the time I reached the door. I heard heavy breathing behind me as I got my dog out. She was scared too, but started growling behind me. I was frozen in place. The breathing continued for a minute before I heard steps started coming toward us. We both took off at the same time. A terrifying scream came out of the base of the woods. I didn't dare look back. I just ran. My pity pulled me all the way back to the house. I got in, flipped off all the lights, and stared out the window at the woods. I could see something moving slightly, but just out of the light. It moved back and forth for about five minutes, then disappeared. It took me forever to fall asleep that night because I was so scared that every little noise freaked me out. The next night, I went to get the dogs earlier, right around dusk. I thought all was good until I was getting my pity out. A huge snapping sound, like a tree branch had just been snapped in half, rang out. It sounded pretty far away, so I just hurriedly got my dog and started toward the house. A few steps away from the kennel, I heard something big start charging toward me from inside the woods. We ran again, and it appeared to follow for so long, then retreated back. Now, every night since then, I hear sounds coming out of the woods like branches breaking and being thrown around, knocking on trees and roaring. I am absolutely terrified. I no longer even take my dogs down. I just take them for walks during the day and make sure we are all in before dusk. I don't know what to do. I'm thinking about buying a gun, but I'm not sure it would help. Driving as Cerro, Hellhound or Skinwalker by Bones21232. Okay, so Friday, 128 a.m., me and my friends decided to go for a drive. We sometimes like to go to the Llano, mountains near El Cerro, to experience something that only happens in that area. Something paranormal and supernatural. Like any other time we do this, we go in my car and drive past Tome Hill, going towards the mountains and park across from VHS about a mile and a half away. Then we sit and take in the scenic beauty of the dark desert. Then, starting by listening close to anything and looking everywhere, we're being hyper-observant. At first, we saw a light in the distance traveling flat on the desert land, getting within about a mile away from us, then disappearing altogether. Moving on from there, we had to, and I mean had to, see something else. Driving through roads and flying by at least 30 miles per hour over the speed limit, we turned down a familiar road. This is where we knew that something was about to change. Me and everyone else, including me, four people in total, looked to the right side of the car. We saw what we all believed to be something like a hellhound or maybe a skinwalker. It was a massive black dog that just launched itself at my car while I was going 45 miles per hour down the road. 
we should have felt impact from the massive creature, but didn't. Both people in the back seat looked and saw this thing rise up from the ground and stand straight up on two legs, absolutely huge and all black with red eyes that are forever imprinted in our minds. I didn't slow down, but sped up, going about 55 miles per hour now, so probably about 20 yards away. They saw it rise up as if nothing happened to it. Creature Sighting by Strawberry Bean To start this off, there are zero bear, moose, or elk where I lived at the time. Background info. At the time, I was about 12 or 14, and I was with my friend who I'll call Kayla. We planned on going on a picnic in her pastures. As we walked up a smaller hill, Kayla pushed me to the ground and whispered, Do you see that? At least 20 or so feet away was a tall creature. It stood on four thin limbs and its head was narrow, similar to a horse or a deer. It was completely black. I couldn't make out features, but it had a mane like a lion, but it seemed flat and coarse. The mane like fur ran along its back, stopping near the rear. It had no tail. Here's a side note. All of the cattle were moved to a completely different area, nowhere near this one. No other livestock animals were in those pastures, but this thing was just staring off. Suddenly, my friend stood up and made a beeline for the exit to the pasture that was at least two miles away. I didn't hesitate to follow her. We finally stopped near the latched fence that led to her house and looked back. We had a pretty good view of the hill it stood on. It was slowly walking back into the trees. This still gives me chills. Montana's Nessie, Flathead Flossie. Skeptics have explained the mysterious creature sighted in Montana's Flathead Lake as an overweight skin diver, a mother-in-law in a swimsuit, a sturgeon, a superfish, a prehistoric holdover, even a wayward seal. As unlikely as it may sound, however, the USO, unidentified swimming object, may not be a hoax. For well more than a century, reports of some kind of large creature in the third largest body of fresh water west of the Great Lakes has kept residents and tourists on the lookout and sightings have been numerous. While most everyone from school age to senior citizen across the world knows about Scotland's Nessie of Loch Ness Lake, similar sightings in other places have not received such worldwide publicity. There are, in fact, many tales about cold, deep, freshwater lakes and sightings of creatures in them. In theory, these lakes could support creatures of very large size. Lake Champlain between New York and Vermont in the United States has its champ, and in Canada, sightings of Ogopogo in Okanagan Lake in British Columbia date back to the 1800s. Manipogo of Lake Manitoba is another. There have been sightings of a creature in Utah's Bear Lake as well. Even Brigham Young believed in that creature, described as an undulating body of light cream color more than 30 feet long. Montana's version reputedly lurks in the deep waters of Flathead Lake, 
a body of water that covers some 189 square miles. The lake is 28 miles long, 10 miles wide, and more than 120 feet deep. Until the mid-1880s, settlement of this remote northwestern region lagged behind the rest of Montana Territory because travel there was so difficult. The advent of the Northern Pacific across Montana in 1883 made access more feasible. Beginning in 1885, steamboats plied the waters of Flathead Lake, carrying goods and passengers between Polson and Demersville, the early settlement that later relocated to become present-day Kalispell. In 1887, settlers and visitors to the Flathead Lake country took the Northern Pacific to a valley where stages left three times weekly. The stage carried the earliest passengers to the little steamer U.S. Grant, a converted sailboat. Equipped with an upright boiler, also known as a donkey engine, and a screw-type propeller, the U.S. Grant's pilot was Captain James C. Kerr, a veteran of the Great Lakes. Captain Kerr skippered flathead steamers from 1886 until his death at the helm of the Klondike in 1909. It was aboard the U.S. Grant that Captain Kerr made the first recorded sighting of the mysterious creature in Flathead Lake. In 1889, he and his startled passengers saw a 20-foot object swimming directly in the steamer's path. Passengers began to panic, and one man aimed his rifle at the object, fired, and missed. The creature disappeared. Thus began the epic of Montana's own lake monster. Since that first incident shocked those aboard the U.S. Grant, two kinds of sightings have produced two different mysteries. One sighting is that of a huge fish, and the other is of a serpent-like creature. In the first kind of report, observers seem to describe a kind of sturgeon. Old-timers recall Indians of the lake country who told of sighting what they called superfish. Experience related by both the Salish and the Kootenai suggests that, historically, sturgeon existed in Flathead Lake. A strong oral tradition in Kootenai songs and stories tells of a fish they called long nose. There are many reported sightings of sturgeon in Flathead Lake. In an oral interview conducted by his family in 1954, Flathead Lake pioneer Joe Zelezny told of an incident that occurred in 1899 while he spearfished by torchlight. Zelezny's homestead was north of what is today Rollins, Montana, in a shallow bay. A carpenter and a homesteader, Zelezny often fished at night, taking large numbers of fish for the family table. On this particular evening, he had finished fishing when he saw something unusual. The object was large, maybe 10 or 12 feet, log-shaped, and lying in the lake on the bottom of a shallow bay area. Joe told his brother Henry to stick the object, handing him the spear. When Henry did so, it came shooting out of the water. It tore loose. It looked exactly like a sturgeon. It couldn't have been anything else. According to John Stroms of the Missoulian, Joe Zelezny was an honest homesteader who had no reason to promote the idea of the flathead monster and nothing to gain. So his report, wrote Stroms, must be given considerable credence. In 1915, a school of sturgeon sighted near Plains in the Clark Fork River was reported heading toward the lake. The huge fish were 60 miles downstream from Flathead Lake and moving in that direction. Then, in 1920, commercial fishermen working on the lake discovered their nets ripped apart by something they assumed must have been a gigantic fish. The late C. Leslie Griffith took the superfish legend to a new level, claiming to have caught a 181-pound, 7.5-foot white sturgeon 
on May 28, 1955. Despite sworn testimony that Griffith hauled the superfish onto his boat off the west shore near Cromwell Island, skeptics dispute that there are any sturgeon in Flathead Lake. But no one has been able to disprove his claim. The fish has since been on display at the Polson Flathead Historic Museum. On September 2, 1960, bathers at the Polson Swimming Beach reported a creature with a head like a horse. Within a day or so, the Zieglers had their own experience. The family, who lived on the grounds of the Polson Country Club, heard large waves crashing and went to investigate. There were no boats in the area, but huge waves were breaking over the swimming pier and on the shore. At the end of the pier, the Zieglers saw something that appeared to be rubbing against the pilings as if scratching its back. Gilbert Ziegler, part-time deputy sheriff, city policeman, and summer groundskeeper at the country club, went to get his rifle. As Mrs. Ziegler moved closer to the pier to see what it was, it suddenly came out of the water. She said, it was horrible looking with a head about the size of a horse and about a foot of neck showing. Was this sighting a sturgeon? A game warden explained that sturgeon, if that's what it was, could appear mammal-like because their mouths are on the underside of their frame and they have whisker-like feelers to boot. The Flathead Courier made a standing offer, $25 to anyone who could either take a picture of the big fish and submit it along with the negative, or make it possible for the paper to take a photograph. So, challenged the courier, keep your cameras loaded and your eyes peeled. Fishermen near Big Fork at the northeastern end of the lake on August 26, 1961, saw something huge circle their boat and speed away when another boat approached. Others reported big fish swimming in schools, but no one snapped a photo. These superfish sightings are generally thought to be sturgeon, but that too is a mystery. If such fish do exist in Montana waters, experts believe that they are likely holdovers of Glacial Lake Missoula or from the Lower Columbia drainage that entered the lake before there were any dams. Freshwater sturgeon takes several decades to reach maturity and can live for over a century. The Kootenai white sturgeon is an isolated population officially listed as endangered in 1994. The largest Kootenai river sturgeon weighed in at 200 pounds. There are 18 white sturgeon populations but only the Kootenai sturgeon was naturally cut off from the lower Columbia River drainage during the last glacial period 10,000 years ago. It is a genetically unique population. There are only 30 miles of white sturgeon habitat in Montana's Kootenai River. Although experts say that Flathead Lake could support a limited population of sturgeon that survived from ages past, and environmental conditions in the upper Flathead River system are ideal for breeding, no hard proof thus far places white sturgeon in Flathead Lake. The second type of sighting is no sturgeon. Whatever the creature is, it and its offspring have been seen enough times, at least 53, for it to merit a name of its own. Flossie seems to fit well in company with other monsters like Nessie and Champ, and a name of its own gives the creature the distinction it deserves. Flossie has been consistently described since the first sighting in 1889. Black brown in color, and 20 to 40 feet in length, although this depends upon how much of the creature is visible at the time of the sighting. Witnesses describe a snake-like head, a body with vertical humps, and a tail tapered like that of an eel. 
In July 1962, a Polson housewife and some California tourists transversing the wood bridge across the Flathead River stopped midway and jumped out of their cars to get a better view of a black object. It was some 15 feet long, moving upstream through the lake outlet. It undulated in an up and down motion, then quickly gained momentum and moved into the main part of Flathead Lake. A few months later, on September 12, 1962, brothers Ronald and Maynard Nixon had a close encounter with a monster whose photos they had helped fake. They had regarded the sightings as a great joke and helped their mother rig some spectacular trick photos of it for tourists. But what the brothers saw 300 feet offshore as they drove along the Polson waterfront made them believers. Ronald Nixon said, It was moving straight away from the shore and fast enough so that the wave at the front was about two feet high. The wake at the back must have been at least 25 feet from the front, so the object must have been longer than that. It couldn't have been a sturgeon. I don't have any idea what it was. Several businessmen out for some fishing on a mild December day in 1962 also saw the creature. They were trolling in Big Arm Bay for lake trout when they suddenly saw what looked like a log pop up out of the water. It came from nowhere. They stopped the motor and watched it drift, then started the motor up again to get closer for a better look. As they did so, the thing disappeared as suddenly as it had surfaced, leaving quite awake. Businessman George Darrow and his wife of Big Fork also saw the creature and long kept quiet for fear of ridicule. They later of their 1971 experience. George recalled that as they sat on the deck of their West Lakeshore home, he saw two, then three loops in the water, 100 yards offshore, moving parallel to the shoreline. The object was snake-like, serpent-like, and there was about eight to 10 feet between loops. On May 25th, 1985, trolling in Yellow Bay, retired Army Major George Coate and his son Neil saw an object as long as a telephone pole and twice as large in diameter. As the creature slowly swam with an undulating motion, they could see four to six humps above the water. It then sped away. At a distance of about 400 meters, it stopped and looked back then disappeared underwater. They knew that no one would believe them, and so they kept quiet about it. Then, in 1987, Coat was driving along Old Highway 93 near Lakeside when he saw the creature again. This time, the creature was quivering as it swam in a forward motion. He saw the entire creature, head, body, and tail. Coat decided to come forward, detailing his two sightings in a letter to the Department of Fish, Wildlife, and Parks in 1990. Coat's descriptions reveal his army training in observation. I counted six to eight coils of its body on the surface, but couldn't see its tail because it was underwater. The Coats know what they saw, said George in his 1990 letter. The Major is a veteran fisherman who had fished the ocean, caught 1,000-pound tuna, and seen sturgeon. I have been out on Flathead Lake over 300 times in the last 15 years. I know what a submerged log looks like. There is no doubt in my mind that it was a huge creature. According to a 30-year veteran, fish, wildlife, and parks fisheries biologist and expert on the Flathead sightings, Laney Hansel, the 13 sightings reported in 1993 were the most in any given year, and one of those was the only report of two creatures. On May 24th, there were two creatures sighted swimming side by side 
in Big Arm Bay. One was larger than the other. In six of the 1993 sightings, witnesses described bait fish that seemed to be jumping out of the water to escape whatever it was. Hansel has seen neither monster nor sturgeon, but admits observing several unexplainable large-sized holes in the nets we pulled from the lake. Not all sightings lack explanation. One proved to be a horse swimming across the lake, and another a flock of birds packed together resembling a 20-foot log. In the 1940s, Los Angeles resident Frank T. Dwyer reported seeing a seal in the lake. I know seals, Dwyer insisted. We stopped, and I saw the seal jump from some large rocks and disappear into the water. A few minutes later, it was swimming near the shore. I learned there are not supposed to be seals in Flathead Lake, but I know definitely there is one there. There were other similar reports of a large mammal at this same time. Several years before, a seal from a traveling circus had indeed escaped into the lake. Mark Henkel reported in the Billings Gazette, September 6, 1998, that according to Jim Vajro, then Regional Fisheries Manager for Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, of the 78 sightings on record from 1889 to 1994, 25 were of a superfish creature and 53 reported as an eel-like object up to 60 feet long with humps and smooth skin. Credible witnesses include lifelong residents and tourists. The most likely places to catch a glimpse of Flossie seem to be in the vicinities Skidoo Bay, Polson Bay, the Narrows, and along the West Shore Road. What is it that so many people have seen? Many believe there is definitely something to the sightings. Even Dorothy Johnson, renowned Montana author who hailed from Whitefish, believed there was something in the lake. In a letter to the then editor of the Flathead Courier, Paul Fugelberg, Johnson wrote, I don't think that the monster should be done with tongue-in-cheek. You have eyewitness accounts by people who were scared and didn't think it was funny. I remember hearing about something in Flathead Lake more than 40 years ago, so don't give the Polson Chamber of Commerce credit for dreaming it up. Fugelberg, historian of Flathead Lake sightings, cataloged some 70 of them. He insists, there's something out there. Visitor Services Bureau Chief Ken Soderberg of Montana State Parks related an incident that Fish, Wildlife, and Parks maintenance supervisor Merle Phillips shared with him a few years ago. Phillips and his crew were called to Wild Horse Island to dispose of a dead horse that was, as Soderberg puts it, making a bit of a stink. While sometimes in such situation the men will resort to dynamite, a nearby cabin made that solution unwise. The horse was stiff as a board and too big to load on the boat, so they built a raft of inflated inner tubes and boards intending to haul it across to shore. They lashed the horse to the boards, legs sticking straight up in the air, but they slightly miscalculated the weight of the horse. Once in the water, it partially submerged. The boat moved slowly, dragging the raft with its unusual cargo. Boats passing by gave the fish, wildlife, and parks crew double takes as they saw what was tethered to the raft. Finally, one boat turned around, pulled alongside the fish, wildlife, and parks craft, and the driver asked, Hey, what are you guys doing? Phillips replied in all seriousness, Mister, I would advise you to stay back from this official boat. The driver was taken aback. Well, how come? What are you doing? Phillips realized he had to come up with an answer. The look on the fellow's face was priceless when he heard Phillips' response. We're trolling for the Flathead Lake Monster. Bigfoot Encounter by Hand of Doom 97 
August 5th of 2017, Mammoth, California. My ex fiance and I were avid climbers, hikers, and explorers of the east side Sierra Nevada mountain range, and we decided to go up to Yosemite to climb. Now, Yosemite is stupid crazy to get campsite reservations for, so we decided to stay on BLM land a few miles down the 395 from Mammoth where we don't have to pay for camping. We pitched our tent and got settled in, made dinner. Then I went to go set up our trash bag about a thousand feet from camp. I don't like having bears close to my tent. It started to rain a little, so we went into the tent and went to sleep around 2030. It was probably 0130 on the 5th. It had stopped raining and I had to take a leak. So I put my flip flops and headlamp and start walking to the spot where I figured it's far enough away that it wouldn't attract anything. Now it had just stopped raining so when it was dead quiet, so I dismissed the silence as everything was hunkered down. So from where I was taking a leak, the trash bag was about 200 yards to my right. As I finish up, I looked to make sure the bag wasn't blown down during the relatively heavy storm that had just finished up, and it wasn't in the tree. So I look at the ground and saw the biggest black bear I'd ever seen. So I start hollering and screaming, making a lot of noise to scare it off. Then it fucking stood up and looked at me, just covered in hair, stood about eight foot with shoulders as wide as meter stick, then ran off. I said, fuck this. I'm going back to the tent and sprinted the entire way. I get back in the tent and my fiance asked me why I was yelling and I told her I was scaring off a bear from the trash bag. She snuggles back in and falls asleep. I'm wide awake, listening intently for any movement when I start hearing footsteps around the car where we kept the food and then the footsteps started coming towards the tent and got scared thinking that this thing, whatever it was, can just come through the tent if it wanted to. It started touching the tent and I can hear heavy breathing and grunting. Then my fiance wakes up, freaks out thinking it was a bear and grabs the keys and hits the panic button on the car and whatever creature ran off. I didn't encounter anything again that trip and I played it off to her as if it was a bear and we should probably find somewhere new to camp that next night. On August 5th, we packed up and left early to go climb in Yosemite and when we came back that night and the new campsite, I approached another camper that I recognized from the previous and he asked me if I noticed anything weird going on the previous night. I told him the story and he said that he heard my screaming and car alarm and both times, shortly after, something went at full lope through his campsite. While going into his vehicle the next morning, he noticed that there were huge handprints on his car's windows and was freaked out enough to move to a new spot as well. He pitched a tent 30 feet from where we were at and we together for the remainder of the trip. I'm not sure what I saw, but the closest thing I can relate it to was Bigfoot. Thanks again for joining me for this compilation of terrifying and creepy cryptid tales. If you enjoyed this episode, please hit that subscribe and notification buttons to know when the latest horror is delivered. Want to hear your true or fictional scary story narrated by me on this channel? 
See the description below for how to submit your story. I'll see you in your nightmares. Good night.